and realize that we are his kids. There'll be no such thing as fear in our lives. Amen. Why you walk right through where my feet were drowned? 
Thank you, Lord. It's amazing that you'd call us your sons and daughters. What a privilege.
Jesus, we just thank you for your amazing sacrifice. Your amazing obedience to the cross. That we would have life. We would have life in abundance. That we would not die. That we would be healed, would be sanctified. We would have eternal life. We would have relationship with the Father for eternity.
Lift up a shout of praise to an amazing Lord. We worship you. We worship you, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Living Stones Church. So glad you're with us. Uh, if you're outside, welcome. If you're online, I'm um, glad you folks are with us too. Right now, kids can head out for children's ministry. 
middle school age group uh, out on the beach under the tent. The um, Sunday school was for grades uh, kindergarten through fifth grade and nursery in the building out to the left. Okay? All right. We've got a few announcements uh, before we jump into the message this morning. First of all, Christmas play, Christmas pageant is tonight, 6 o'clock out here on the lawn. It was an amazing time last year. If it's anything like last year, you don't want to miss it. If you've got kids involved in it, you'll be there, of course. But if you don't, come on down and join, it, join us anyway. It's going to be a, a great time. Uh, also, we've got a young adult's Christmas potluck coming up. 18 to 28-year-olds are invited. It's Wednesday right here, 6 p.m., uh, dinner, games, fellowship. Invite a friend. Uh, the only requirements are you're between 18 and 28. That is like actual chronological age. If you're 40, you feel 28, you're not invited. <laughs> the idea is we're going to like check IDs probably on this because some people are kind of fudging over the limit with that. Um, we've also got coming up, of course, our Christmas Eve services. They'll be here December 24th. That's a Saturday this year, 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. out on the lawn. As I told you last week, if you come to the 5 p.m. service, you want to get here by about 4.30 at the latest for parking. If you're coming for the 7 o'clock service, don't get here any earlier than 6.30 because we won't let you in the parking lot before that. We've got to empty out the first service parking lot for the second service to come in, so just help us to avoid gridlock. Still time to sign up if you want to help with that. Uh, volunteer sign-up sheets are outside. And uh, last but not least... Um, ways to give. You can give online, by mail. We've got boxes outside. I bring that up now. We don't usually talk about it during the year because some people don't give weekly, monthly, but give one time at the end of the year, and I don't want you to forget about it before the 31st. So this is the opportunity to, to do what, um, well, to do what's a measure of faith, a measure of faith in terms of trusting God that he who provided you with what you have will help you to get by with less than what you have when you are generous with the things of the kingdom. And again, I'll say it again, this is about giving, not here necessarily. Just give somewhere. Just give somewhere is the idea. It's a matter of, of expressing to God that you know it came from him, and so you're feeding back, seeding back into the kingdom. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for your love, for your grace, for your goodness, for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here to straighten us out when we get your word messed up, to give us the understanding on how to apply your word in our lives. And I just ask today, Holy Spirit, you'd soften hearts, open minds, enable us to change, to change, to be willing, to have the humility, to change our minds where we need to change our minds. Sometimes it's a 180, sometimes it's a 20 degree shift, but to whatever degree it needs to happen today, we ask, I ask that you'd help me to do it for myself, help each of us just be willing to make those adjustments to grow as you want us to grow. All of it we ask in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Okay, we have been looking the past couple of weeks at the Advent season. That's the, the idea that Jesus Christ entered time, history. His Advent was that, that coming into history. And we looked the past couple of weeks at um, what he brought with him, peace, joy. I want to start off this week a little bit differently by asking you a trivia question. A trivia question is this. What is the most frequently repeated promise in the Bible? There's one promise in the Bible, when you look through all of Old and New Testament, that stands head and shoulders above every other promise. Far outnumbers every other promise in the Bible. Anybody know what it is? Nobody in the first service knew what it is. No, not you, Mary Catherine. You know everything. <laughs> so I'm going to say it, and then you can say, yes, that's what I thought, even though you were probably wrong. The idea is the... the, the, the the most repeated promise in Scripture is, I'll be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. Started in Genesis, continues on. Yeah, I know. Everybody's like <laughs> taking, taking this claim of knowledge here. But, okay, it's I'll be with you. Okay, I'll fess up. I didn't know it until earlier this week. I Googled it. I Googled, what is the most frequently repeated promise in the Bible? It's I'll be with you. Started in uh, Genesis with Adam and Eve. It goes on through the Old Testament with most of the patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Moses, Noah. It, it continues on into the New Testament with, with Mary, with Paul, with, with so many others, with so, so many others. Why is it? Why is it that that is the most repeated promise in Scripture? And the reason is, is because it gives us hope. It provides us with hope. I mean, without knowing or believing that God is actually with us, it's, it's oftentimes a hopeless situation. But, but that's what it, it really is all about. Hope's a big part of the, the Advent season. I mean, again, 
this is the time when we look at, at certain Christmas words, certain Christmas words. Um, most of the time during the, the rest of the year, you don't talk too much about Emmanuel or the Incarnation. But those are two words that come in at Christmas quite, quite frequently. What is the Incarnation? The Incarnation <coughs> is the, um, the idea, the, the fact that God took on human flesh, that God became a man, fully man, fully God. He became a man and entered history as Jesus. Now, this is something that really can rock your boat if you think about it. When Jesus took on human flesh, he took it on eternally. He took on human flesh, was born as a baby, came into this world, lived a perfect life, died on a cross for our sins, resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven, will return again on a white horse in the clouds, and will abide with us forever in the new earth, the new heaven, but he'll be abiding forever in a human form. The scars are still in his hands. I mean, fully God still, but fully man at the same time. It's mind-blowing. Now, in addition to the incarnation, the other word that comes in is, is Emmanuel. What's that? Well, it's what we're talking about as part of the promise. Emmanuel means literally God with us. It's one of the names of Jesus. It's actually a name that was prophesied for Jesus back in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before he was ever born. There's this prophecy that comes through Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, again, remember, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus is born, Isaiah the prophet is speaking to Israel, saying, look, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. The Lord will himself give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, <clears throat> the people to whom he spoke that prophecy, you know, they heard it, but it didn't have probably a whole lot of impact on them, honestly. It didn't have a whole lot of impact. They didn't see it happen. And succeeding generations, I'm not sure it had a whole lot of impact. But for us, it ought to have a whole lot of impact because we're able to look back and see the prophetic declaration of what had not yet happened hundreds of years before it happened as just one more piece of the evidence in terms of the fact that God is in control of all of this. But what happens? The incarnation, God in the flesh, comes to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. But most of the people, when Jesus came, most of the people, when Jesus came, didn't recognize him for who he was. Most of the people today, despite the, the evidence, Old and New Testament, don't recognize him for who he is. I mean, it's kind of like, picture this. You've got a master artist a master artist who paints an amazing picture. And then the artist steps in, is able to step in to the picture that he paints. And he's walking the streets of the village that he's painted with the people that he painted walking the same streets. But none of the people recognize him as the artist that painted them. Nobody knows him. And it's kind of the way it was when, when Jesus enters history, time and space. I mean, he's walking the streets. And we, the people he created don't recognize the artist that created us. And this is something, again, that's not just a whimsical thought, but it, it says this in John chapter 1, verse 10. John chapter 1, verse 10 said he was in the world. The artist came, the artist who, who painted it all, and the world that was made through him didn't know him, didn't know him. I mean, it's a, a, a really radical kind of thing when you think about it. Jesus arrived as Savior and came to bring freedom came to bring freedom from sin for us, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, freedom to be who God created us to be. He came to enable us to be who God originally created Adam and Eve to be. He came to enable us to be filled with the fullness of all that he brought with him, to be filled with the fullness of what we talked about the past two weeks, to be filled with peace, to be filled with joy, and what we're going to look at today, to be filled with, with hope. What do you think you're filled with today? I mean, really, getting religion out of the way, getting church talk out of the way, what do you think you're filled with today? And is there a test to tell what you're filled with today? Well, the answer is yes, there's a test. The test is this, what comes out when you get bumped? I mean, when you're full, whatever bumps you then causes what's in you to spill over the top. And I know I got bumped a few times this week, and joy, peace, and hope didn't always come out. The idea is it, it's a test and ought to be a wake-up call. I mean, we need to be people that are self-aware, self-aware enough to make the adjustments that we need to make, to cry out for the grace that we need, to make the decisions that we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to make 
in order to see the changes come in. And, and so be thinking about it. Through this Christmas season especially, you're going to get bumped a lot. What comes out when you get bumped? Is it going to be peace? Is it going to be joy? Is it going to be, be a hope that continues on with a no matter what kind of thing? So let's just jump into this whole matter of hope. Hope is something that gets confusing when Christians talk about it, when anybody talks about it, because it's one thing in the English language, language it's another thing in, in a biblical sense. So I want to look today at how we get it, how we keep it, how we can grow it. Hope, as an English word, is synonymous with wishing something. I hope this will happen, I wish this will happen. It's, it's the way it works in English. But biblically, in Hebrew and in Greek, that's not the way it comes across. The, the words in Hebrew and in Greek that are translated into the English hope carry with them no, no part of doubt coming into the equation. In, in fact, those words mean, quite literally, a, a, an expectation, a confident expectation, a certain expectation. It's, it's something which future expectations are centered on. Biblically, hope is something future expectations are centered on. So it's not wishful thinking. It's, it's, not, it's not optimism. Optimism is not bad, but optimism is psychological, and hope is theological. Optimism is where you trust in you. Hope is where you trust in God. Optimism is what you think you can do. Hope is what you, you believe God can do. Optimism, optimism often tends to deny reality. But hope acknowledges that there are sometimes bad things that actually do happen, but look beyond the bad things to the God who's in control of the past, the present, and the future. I mean, the, the classic example of this, the, the poster boy for hope, is, is Abraham. We talked about him a little bit last week with joy, but let's pull it up again in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Context with Abraham. He's an old guy. God promises him and his wife, who's an old lady, that they're going to have a baby. And then years and years and years go by, like 20, and still no baby. So they started off old, and now they're really old. And what happens? What, what's the attitude that Abraham takes on? It's described by God in Romans chapter 4. It says that in hope against hope, Abraham believed so that... He might become. We talked about that, that last week, that matter of believing so you become. You become what you believe. I mean, again, I know I talked about it this way last week. It sounds like really like a new age statement that you'd make, believe in order to become. But it's biblical. We actually do and can only really become what we believe. If we don't believe we can become it, we can't become the fullness of what God wants us to be. And hope against hope, he believes so that he might become, become what? A father of many nations. According to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So what was, what was, he, what was he doing? What Abraham was doing was, he wasn't denying the reality of what was in front of him. He was looking in the mirror, and he wasn't looking in the mirror going, man, you still got it, you're still a handsome guy, you're virile, you're strong. Man, you look like a 25-year-old, Abraham. He didn't do any of that. Nor did he tell Sarah, you're looking good, you're looking like you did when you were 19. He's saying, and he recognized, they're both old. They're wrinkly, they're sagging everywhere where you don't want to sag. And yet, he's saying, despite the reality of the circumstances that I see, I'm looking beyond the circumstances to the God who's bigger than the circumstances. I'm looking at the promises that this God has made, and my hope is not in what my body looks like. My hope is in the promise that God has made. That's, that's what hope is supposed to look like. Now, I mean, you want to do a, uh, uh, the other side in another case study, because Abraham is a case study in what hope is supposed to look like. Let's look, like a, look, let's look at a similar situation, what it's not supposed to look like. You've got Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, also an old man. Also someone who, along with his wife Elizabeth, had been praying for a child forever. And now an angel comes to Zacharias. He's a priest. I mean, he's, he's supposed to know all about God. And an angel comes. An angel physically manifests himself to, to, to um, Zacharias and says, You know that baby you've been praying for? You've been praying for and asking for this baby. We're going to give it to you. And what happens with him? I mean, he doesn't believe it. 
He doesn't believe it. And God says, well, shut your mouth. You're not going to say another word then until after this baby comes because I don't want to hear any negative self-talk coming into this thing. And he doesn't let Abraham speak until the baby comes out of Sarah's womb. And then he agrees, yes, his name is John. So, I mean, you've got ways to go with this. And hopefully we can look at what Scripture says and be convinced that, that Abraham's the, the guy that we want to line up behind. I mean, hope is supposed to be, it tells us in Scripture, the focus of our faith. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Very basic um, instruction on what faith looks like and what hope looks like. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, usually when I see that verse and when I hear that verse talked about, faith is a star and hope has a supporting role. But look at it and think about what it's saying. Hope is a star here. Faith has a supporting role. It is hope that we set our faith upon, not faith that we set our hope upon. Faith is what God has said. Faith are the promises God has made based on the character of who God is. Faith is about believing the purposes that God has laid out, the plans that he's let us know about. And that hope that's based on all of those things is in something that faith moves forward to. Basically, basically, hope provides the target for our faith. If we have no hope, then you don't have anything to hang your faith on. Faith is just a bunch of, you know, mumbo-jumbo, talk, wishes, whatever you want to call it, but faith only becomes biblical, godly faith when there's a hope that it attaches to. And so this, again, is why hope is such an important thing for us to know about and to ponder and, and to understand, again, how we, how we raise it up and, and understand rightly what it is. I mean, we get, sometimes we can get disillusioned, disillusioned as we walk as people of hope. And what, what is disillusionment? Well, disillusion is when we have illusions about something and we lose our illusion, right? Now, disillusionment is talked about usually as a bad thing. I think disillusionment is a good thing because really with disillusionment, what's happening? We have an illusion. That is, we've got this idea about something that doesn't really exist. That's what an illusion is. And when we're disillusioned, then we're separated from that thing that didn't really exist in the first place. So, so often the disillusionment that we feel is something that, that we need to feel in order to get our heads on straight to walk out the lies that God has us to walk out. I mean, there, okay, I'm going to step on worship team's toes here. There's a song that we sing fairly often, and I, I like it. I mean, it's, it's upbeat, it's catchy. Um, the song is, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let me down. And we, we sing that, you know, about the Father. You're never going to let me down. And I sing it with gusto. And the worship team does not like that when they do sing with gusto. But, but the idea is, I, I, I sing it because I believe it. Kind of. Kind of. I mean, you've got to put a bunch of asterisks and caveats in there and footnotes underneath that. Because do you really, do you really have the experience of God never letting you down? I mean, theologically, in the abstract, okay, I know all things work together for good, so that means, I guess, in the big picture, he doesn't let me down. But I certainly have felt let down before. I've certainly felt lost before. I've certainly felt like this is something that, you know, I wanted and thought God had said he was going to give me, and I didn't get. I felt that before. I imagine you have, too. The idea is we're, we're not prohibited from feeling let down. It's the idea, though, that we can't let the feelings of let down rob us of the, the reality of of the hope that's supposed to be there. Because bad things happen. Bad things happen. They're going to happen. I mean, I hate to be <laughs> laying this on you, you know, for next year, but you're going to have some bad things happen to you next year. <laughs> but the idea for us is, is that as, as people to retain and maintain hope, we've got to understand how we handle circumstances that are in front of us both the good and the bad things, the circumstances that come into life. And I've, I've told you this before. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like this. This pen. These are the circumstances I've got in my life right now. I, it, each time I pick up the pen in the morning, it's the circumstance that's in front of me for that day. Who knows what it is for you? Health, finances, your marriage, your kids, whatever. This is it. Now, that clock back there, which says it's 9.44 a.m., that's God. Right now, I can see both the pen and the clock. But if I really focus on the pen, I can't tell you what time it is. 
But interestingly, if I focus on the clock, I can still see the pen. It's still here, but my focus is on the big picture back there with the time. Now, if this is about circumstances and God, think of how that plays out. We don't deny the existence of circumstances. I mean, the whole bit of, of, of a positive confession that denies the reality of what's in front of you is, is silly. The idea is we, we can acknowledge the reality of what's in front of us. I'm sick right now, for goodness sakes, but I'm looking beyond that to being healed. It, it's the idea that we don't deny the circumstances that we're in, but we fix our focus upon the bigger picture that's on on behind that, that's the overarching big picture of the God who's in charge of the circumstances. And, and with that, what happens? We retain hope. We're looking at the one who's the, the giver of hope, the giver of hope with, with us. I mean, it's the idea that, again, back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, that with faith and hope, you can liken it to a, an air conditioning system. Hope is the thermostat in the air conditioning system. You set the thermostat on your AC system in your house or your condo, and then what happens? Faith is the power unit that kicks in to get the temperature matching up with the thermostat. And that's what hope does. Hope provides the target. It provides the thermostat to set the temperature, the culture. And faith is what gets us there. Hope can also be thought of as, as, um, as the accent of our faith. I mean, we've got people around here that come from different countries that have different accents. My wife has a Chinese accent. Andrew West has a silly Australian accent. There are other people that have different kinds of accents. I mean, you usually, actually, when we think about accents, we think about the way people speak. But there's also an accent in the way we see things. I mean, you talk to somebody from, you know, a different culture, a different country, and the way they see beauty is completely different. I mean, there can be a guy from one culture who sees a woman, and he says, she's beautiful. I'm going, not so much. And then, you know, vice versa. You know, there's a, just a difference that comes into play in terms of how we see things for their culture. But there's also a difference in the accents that, that, we, have, that we have in terms of, of hope. Hope sets a cultural accent for our faith, and it sets the goal of whether we have a big faith or a little faith. I mean, what we have as our hope sets the accent of how our faith is walked out. If our hope accent is simply God's going to do whatever God does, then we've got one kind of accent with our faith. If our hope accent is that, yeah, God's going to do what he does, but God has said you don't have because you don't ask, then we've got a different accent to the kind of faith we walk out, right? I mean, and so this is, again, where hope can make all the difference in the accent of a culture, a culture of faith, and what that's supposed to look like. And so we, we want to be intentional. We want to be intentional about making sure that we've got that, that right accent in, in place with all of this. It's, it's, hard with, um, it's hard with hope. Because, again, hope is about what we don't yet see. Hope is about something that's not seen yet. Once we see it, once we have it, once we grab it, there's no reason to hope for it anymore. It's, it's something, though, that because we don't see it, hope, it loses what's called object permanence. Uh, we experience this lack of object permanence often. I mean, last night, it, it kind of cleared up a little bit for a period of time. We're able to see a bunch of stars in, in the sky from the back of our house. Wonderful. This morning, you get up, no stars are there. Are the stars gone? They're not gone. They're still there. I mean, they move around, I know. But, but the idea is there's an object permanence that's there. Really, because these stars are still there, whether it's daytime or nighttime, but we lose object permanence as we can't see the stars, and so we start denying, as they did in, in ancient cultures, start denying that the stars are even there because we don't see them. It's the same way with hope. Object permanence needs to be in place for us. The hope is there, the hope that we don't see. But to lose object permanence, to lose hope simply because we don't yet see it, and worse to lose hope because we see circumstances that seem to be big enough where they're going to block the ability for that object of hope to be realized is something that's pretty bad. I mean, we, we a lot of us experience that during the past few years. I mean, I think the past three years or so with politics and, and pandemics were, among other things, God's wake-up call for us to be able to look around and say, where was your faith? Where was your hope? 
Where was your hope? Was your hope in vaccinations or no vaccinations? Was your hope in, in Donald Trump or Joe Biden? Where was your hope? And, and, I mean, I think across the board, whichever way you fall on the science or the politics, hopefully you've come out of this whole season going, there is no hope in man, in politics, or in science, as wonderful as it can be. Ultimately, I'm speaking. I mean, interimly, yes, there's some stuff we need to be paying attention to. I get it. But ultimately, the hope is in Jesus. That's where the hope is. And, and, and I think that's one of the reasons we've gone through what we have the past few years in order for, for God to say, look, wake up, call, get aware of who you are, get aware of where your head is, and, well, okay, get aware, get, get aware of how you're thinking. Get aware of how you're thinking and, and get your thinking straightened out. It's, it's something that, that matters a, a whole lot because the hope we have, the right hope, is a choice that we make. It's a choice that we make. How does the choice begin? How does the process begin with what choice initially? And the initial choice is you choose hope by initially choosing Jesus. Because ultimately, there is no hope without Jesus. It's choosing Jesus so that you then have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the promises of God belonging to you. And then once that's in place, by choosing Jesus, we choose the, the commission that he's given us in his kingdom. That is, to be one who is focused upon seeing the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven, to seeing the kingdom of God extended, to seeing, to seeing yes, good things happen in this world to bad people sometimes because that's the plan God has in place. We want to see the kingdom extended in every which way with the works of the devil destroyed, with the love of the Father overcoming the strategies that the enemy has in place, with truth replacing, with truth, truth replacing lies. We want to become people who carry the aroma of hope. There's a, a verse in, in Corinthians that, that God told Paul to write that said, pay attention to what you smell like. Pay attention to what you smell like. That's not what he said, but this was the, the ultimate focus of the verse. It's be aware if you've got a spiritual body odor because you can have a good one or a bad one. You can have a, an aroma of life or death. It said you can smell one way to God, one way to non-believers, one way to believers. I want you to have an aroma that smells like life. I want you to have an aroma that smells like Christ so that the people are attracted to you. It's, it's something that, that we're supposed to be intent upon as we become people that are contagious with the hope that we have. Ultimately, this hope that we're talking about here is not based on information about God, but based on intimacy with God. I mean, sometimes we can get off track with this. And we go, okay, well, you put a bunch of Bible verses out there, and I'm going to memorize those Bible verses, and then I'll have hope. Well, it's a good start. But knowing Scripture and being immersed in Scripture is not enough. Scripture is there for us to have a relationship with the writer of the love letter that we have in Scripture. It's the idea that you don't fall in love with the letters. You fall in love with the author of the letters. It's the idea that it's a relationship of intimacy that God has called us to, and ultimately the hope that we have needs to be based upon that intimacy of relationship that he has, has called us into. It requires us to focus on the one with whom we have the relationship the hope. Again, classic story is with Peter walking on the water, Matthew 14. You you remember the story? Peter called by Jesus, the one that he loves, the one that he believes is the Messiah. And Jesus says, come on out here, Peter, do this with me. This is fun. And Peter hops out of the boat and fixes his eyes on Jesus, and he walks on the water. But then, Matthew 14, read on the account, he, he takes his eyes off of Jesus and puts his eyes on the wind and the waves, and he begins to sink. He takes his eyes off the clock and starts looking at the pen. And he begins to sink. Now, question. There, were, there was wind and there were waves. Did the wind and the waves make Peter sink? I mean, was it easier, would it have been easier for Peter to walk on a glassy sea than it, it would be if there were three foot, five foot swells on the sea? And the answer, of course, is no. Both are impossible, but for, but for God. And, and this is where, again, we are. It's the idea of fixing our focus on the one who's called us out. It's about fixing our focus on on the one who is overseeing the situation. We Again, we can't always change our situation. We can't change the storms and make them go away. 
We can't change the wind and the waves and, and say, be gone, wind and waves. Sometimes we can, but not always. But what we can do always is fix our focus. Fix where the focus is. Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 to 23 is a great go-to reminder of how this works. Old Testament. It says, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease because his compassion, his love for you never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. I mean, a few verses like that, again, I'm not saying that the verses make the difference as much as what the verses point to, and the verses point to the one who wrote the verses to us, who's called us into a relationship where we trust him in, in all of this. So, where is your hope based? Hebrews 6.19 says it's supposed to be an anchor for our soul. It's supposed to hold us in place. It's supposed to be something solid that keeps us where God wants to keep us. Contrary to Sandra Bullock, I, I've never seen the movie, but the title says it to me, hope doesn't float. Hope does not float. It's the idea that hope is an anchor. It keeps us solidly in place. But the analogy that I like better than any other, really, is hope is a ladder. It's like a ladder that we climb. We are in a life where we're climbing a ladder of hope. And it's not a step ladder, it's an extension ladder. And it's leaning against something. Everybody's ladder of hope is leaning against something. And the question is, what's your ladder of hope leaning against? What's the wall that your ladder of hope is leaning against? Is, is it leaning against your job? Is it leaning against your, your retirement account? Is it leaning against relationships? Everybody's got a ladder of hope leaning against something. We're born with a ladder of hope. We lean it against our parents. We don't know that, but that's where it's leaned. It's against our parents. And then shifts over time. Our ladder of hope then maybe shifts to, to our peer group or then to our education or then to, I mean, the list goes on and on. Sports ability, beauty, money, whatever. But it's leaning against something. And the idea is that the ladder of hope, the only way the ladder of hope is going to be something that really works, that maintains stability, is when it's leaning against Jesus. It's that, that leaning against Jesus that's going to make all the, the difference in, in the world. Now, the trouble is, some of you right here, some of you online or outside, you've leaned your ladder of hope against Jesus, and you have been disillusioned. You've been disappointed. You've been discouraged. And, and the question is, how does that happen? What happened? How can I have my ladder of hope leaning against Jesus and yet have this discouragement and this, this disappointment come into to play? Well, a couple of possibilities. There are several, but I'll look at two real quickly. One possibility is you didn't know it, but you moved your ladder. You started off. You started off trusting Jesus. You were all in. But then over time, your, your ladder moved off of Jesus and onto the church. Or your ladder moved off of Jesus and onto some teacher, preacher, group leader, whatever it is. Your, your ladder of hope maybe moved further than that, moved to to, you know, your abilities or, again, back to the, the stuff that everybody else has it leaning against, money and power and, and fame. And, and what's happening there is you, know, you, you need to recognize that you've moved it. Again, that self-awareness comes into play. Another possibility is that, that you only thought you had your ladder of hope leaned against Jesus. But with you, it was just a symbolic gesture. You, you went through the motions of, of leaning that ladder of hope against Jesus, of making a, a declaration of your faith. Maybe you got baptized, I don't know. But, but the truth is, your ladder's there, but you wouldn't in a million years climb that thing. I mean, it's like I'm not trusting it to climb it. And, and that says a lot about what you think about what your ladder is leaning against. You've got the promises of Scripture. You've got the commands of the Scripture, and you never, never got it that God's love language is obedience. And it's like you're going, well, but, but I don't agree with what he says in Scripture. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't even seem fair. It seems archaic. Too bad. I mean, the idea is that if we've got our hope based on the one who created everything, it, it's the idea that we're going to have that, that ladder staying in place and, and we're going to be climbing the ladder, again, as more, of a symbol, more than a symbolic gesture and, and move on with what we need to do. It's, it's the idea, again, that hope is the ability for us, day-to-day -day life, to face the facts that are before us while keeping our focus on God. That's 
simply what we've talked about for the past 35 minutes. So what are the facts against you today? I mean, what are the facts against you today that you need to be aware of, but that need to be perhaps where you take your focus, primary focus off of, and put it on God? I mean, is it your marriage? Is it your health? Is it your kids? Is it money? Is it an addiction? Is it, is it a lack of purpose? It's, it's the idea that, that these aren't things that, that by ignoring them they go away, but it is a situation where we've got to look at the things that are behind them. I mean, hope is the foundation for change. Hope is the foundation for change. Hope is the foundation for joy. Hope is the foundation for peace. But hope is the foundation for things that, that we need to have changed in our, our lives. And we need to become people that, well, as Tim Keller said, Tim Keller's a, a pretty famous preacher, writer. Um, he said you can tell somebody who doesn't have hope because they always freak out. They always freak out. I mean, stuff comes around and they freak out. People with hope don't have that tendency in, in the same way. So, what do we do? Number one, we need to get our ladder back in the right place. We need to get our ladder back in the right place. It starts, perhaps, for some, with the directions we get from Romans 15.4. Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope, have hope. So we do get Scripture. We do have Scripture to help us get hope, to help us move towards the writer of Scripture. And then Romans 15, 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So number one, again, get your ladder in the right place. The Holy Spirit and Scripture or a big part of the answers on how to do that. Number two, get your perspective straightened out. Get your perspective straightened out and just ask yourself, again, with that whole pen and clock deal, are you magnifying God? Are you magnifying God? Magnifying God, despite how we might approach it in worship, is not about making God bigger. We cannot make God any bigger. God is as big as he's going to be. He's big, period. The idea with magnifying God is we make our perspective of God bigger. We look at God in such a way that we see him as bigger. We get closer to him because the closer we get to him, the bigger that God is going to look for each one of us. We want to see him for who he, he really, for who he really is. And it really matters how big we see God because our perspective determines the future that we will experience. We are people who experience our perspective. Think about it and you'll agree. The perspective that you have on something will determine the future that you walk in. You focus, you have the perspective on circumstances controlling your life, then you will experience circumstances controlling your life. You have the perspective of a God, the God, who's very big and very good, and you will experience the hope that comes from knowing that we have a God who's very big and very good you get to determine, in large part, the perspective that you have based on the evidence that you live through. Because the perspective that you have, whether it's Bob or whether it's Paul, it's going to be based on different evidence many times, but the perspective still needs to be ultimately based upon the God who is over all of it. Again, last example. We're going to get out of here real quick. Twelve spies in Israel. What happens? They go into the promised land. And they bring back evidence from the promised land. What's the evidence they bring back from the promised land? What's in all the pictures that you see? Big old grapes. Exactly. Big old grapes. Big old grapes. Ten of the spies basically are saying big old grapes come from big old guys that we'll never beat. Two, Caleb and Joshua said, yes, big old grapes. We see the same evidence you do. We see the same big old guys who grew the big old grapes, but we've got a big God who's bigger than the big guys. They had a perspective based on the evidence that differed from the perspective based on the evidence, the same evidence that other people saw. It's the same way that it works with us. Again, pandemics, politics, or, you know, an economy that's going up and down like crazy. It's the idea that we're supposed to be people who can look at the same evidence that everybody else is looking at, but the perspective is changed in terms of what we do with it. The question that we, we come away with, and we've talked about it before, is what kind of spy are you going to be? What kind of hope are you going to carry out? So, application as we go out this week, 
Number one, practice the presence of the one who gave us Scripture. Practice the presence of the one who's called us into relationship and given us hope. Number two, realize the power of our perspective. Realize the power that comes with the perspective that follows what we focus on. And number three, grow your imagination. Let your imagination grow. They don't use the imagination word in Scripture so much, but it's, it's actually there, you know, in indirect in ways. Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas More, maybe you heard about him. He got burned at the stake because of a stand he took for God against the king of England, saying, King, I'm going to serve you, but I, I see that God is above you, and I'm not going to ever deny that God is bigger than you are. Sir Thomas More said, It's my conviction that slight shifts in imagination have more impact on living than major efforts at change. I mean, think about this. This is so cool, so cool. Because it's the idea that as we let our imagination flow with Scripture, as we let our imagination flow with the hope that God has set out before us, as we let our imagination go with the things that God has laid out as possibilities before us, well, what happens? Well, I mean, it, it changes us. It changes us, again, again, according to Thomas More, it changes us more than having major efforts put into changing. Because what happens? We follow our thinking. The... the, the the, the biggest train of thought we have is going to be what carries us through life. Last one, uh, J.R. Tolkien was slamming C.S. Lewis before C.S. Lewis became a Christian. And he said to C.S. Lewis, he said, Your inability to understand who Jesus is stems from a failure of imagination on your part. I think that's where some of you are. I mean, not you folks inside because you're all following Jesus if you're inside here. But if you're online or outside, <laughs> you guys, a failure of imagination may be what's at play. You need to learn to dream again. You need to be children again. That's why Jesus said that the, the, the ones who follow him have a child likeness about him where they dream and let their imaginations run rampant and don't let their silly human reasoning Get in the way of the reality, the hope that God has laid out before us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your amazing love. Uh, we thank you for your hope. And I ask you right now, right now, Holy Spirit, <clears throat> to touch hearts and minds, to soften hearts and to open minds, to bring a humility that enables repentance, that enables the gift of repentance to flow in, I ask that you'd enable us to learn hope, to learn what it means to be a people of hope, that smell like hope, that, that recognize, that recognize uh, 